Welcome to Keeping the Feeder Company. Woo! Does that sound good? Yeah. I, I always listen back to it and think I sound really cheesy. No, I, um, I quite like you to, to sort of venture into cheese zone because you're so uncheesy <laughs> in everything you do <laughs> that I like you to just see you dip a toe in the cheese lake That's and then the step away again. Anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> So my name is Athena Cabenu, I'm a stand-up comedian, writer, podcaster, a child, um, and it's brilliant, and I like it, but she doesn't talk, children don't talk really. She will. One day the child will talk, but until then I'm going to need to invite people around to keep my company. So thanks for coming around, Katie Lane! Pleasure. If I had an audience, we'd applaud you. Yeah, thank you, well, I'll just applaud myself in- internally. Katie, tell me about, your- don't tell me about yourself, I know you, tell yeah. the three subscribers that I have <laughs> about <laughs> about yourself oh god I'm well number one I'm useless at doing tell me about yourself but I met you I was thinking about this on the way I met you seven years ago seven I don't yeah. remember when we first met on the stand-up so I think we first met at a gig in Surbiton when I was just starting to creep into kind of m25 zone gigs and then we went to another gig near there and you drove in your in your Ford car or Ford K8. You have a remarkable memory. Have you still got that car? That car blew up. What? Two story. I was on the M1 and I was heading back to London and the bonnet just flew up and all this black steam came out. I think it was not the carburetor, the head gasket. The head gasket blew. And once the head gasket goes... I didn't realise cars um, had gaskets. I thought it was just old Victorian steam trains had gaskets. Well, the K, the K was very old. I bought that car for 300 quid. Do you drive? I do drive. It's really weird. I passed my driving test in 1991 and I have never owned my own car. Really? So I'm 45 years old and the only car I drive is my mother's car. Because I've always lived in London and I've never had a job outside London where I might need a car. And every time I felt a bit flush, which is not that often, but when I had a real job, I believe you can pick up a Ford K8 for £300. <laughs> and I've rung my sister, who's never lived in London. She's always had a car. I said, oh, Fia, you know, I think, I think I might get a car. And she went, okay, tax, MOT, petrol, insurance, this, that, the other, parking, blah, blah, blah. Do you still want a car now? And I'm like, no. It's honestly, it's a, it's a it's way to burn It's such money. an expense, I know. It's such an expense. The only reason why I've always driven is because I'm the only one who drives in my immediate family. Fine. So I'm the airport. Designated IKEA, driver. Yeah. I'm, I'm that person. Yeah, stuff like IKEA. Like, I haven't been to IKEA for about 10 years purely because I don't have a car. And that's a good thing. That's oh no. Get rid of a car. I hate IKEA so much. Not a complaint. I hate shopping. Like everything I hate about shopping is in IKEA. You can never find what you want. They purposefully hide everything. Yeah. And they put the most useful everyday stuff at the part of the store that takes the longest to get to. Like I just want a tin opener. That's what I want. Oh yeah, but you've got to go through the sofas and the bean bags and everything oh, first. It's, it's stressful. So. It's stressful. You were telling me about yourself and then we got sidetracked. Oh, so yeah, so we got to, I met you seven years ago. Yes. I had started comedy probably about the same time as you, six months before that. And the reason I started doing stand-up age, how was I, 37, 38, um, is because I'd just come back from a three-year um, working stint in Spain. And the reason I've been to Spain is because I totally burned out of my previous job. So I have one of those. What was your previous job? My previous job was in a media agency, which is the less glamorous side of advertising i you don't make the pictures and the adverts you just decide where they go right but actually it's having having worked with both types i would definitely choose that side because on the other side if you work on the creative side unless you are the actual creative person yourself if you're the account manager your job is effectively working with alan who's a 47 year old marketing director from you know guildford right and getting him to liaise with or her if it's a female marketing director to liaise with sort of baz and boff who are like a cool creative team on skateboards in some agency in shoreditch and that's what you've got to sort of manage is that and it's so so stressful and and very i would say thankless and a lot of egos oh god so being on the media side is much better and you I had a brilliant time in the in my party days as i say with a kind of early to mid 2000s where budgets were much bigger so loads of kind of parties and trips and a oh, great time absolutely great time and then i just kind of burnt out it's a very it's very much a young young man's game so i went off uh i, I started a new job that i absolutely loathed more than anything 
and I was terribly, terribly what depressed. Job was this? It was well, I'd been in my previous job, which I loved for a long time, and I was in danger of becoming that person where everyone would go, "Oh yeah, she's been here for ages," and <laughs> and I didn't want to be that person. So I thought, right, grow up a bit, stretch yourself, find a job that's going to test you a bit more. So I did that, and within five days, I just thought, this is the worst decision I've ever made, and I stayed there for three months. By which time. I was as physically burnt out as I've, as I've ever been. And I know that's not going to induce much sympathy. Oh, poor you. No, yeah, it totally but does. Because that's what happens. Looking back, I think I had a, I think I was having a nervous collapse, if not nervous breakdown. And it was still, so this was just over 10 years ago. It was still sort of in the days where you didn't run everything through HR. It wasn't right. that kind of company. Whereas now I look back, I think, well, I should have flagged it up with them and I should have put everything on paper and all the rest of it. Anyway, so I went to uh, do a TEFL teaching course in Spain for, I thought I'd do that for six months. I couldn't afford to just go traveling and not earn any money. So I did that for a while and just loved it. And because I'd had a proper job before, they were sending me off to teach in businesses and things. And I really, really liked it. So I stayed out there for three years. I did two years in Seville and a year in Madrid, which is, if I'd gone to Madrid when I was 25 instead of 35, I'd I'd still be there now. It's an wow. amazing what? city. Madrid is brilliant. It's a proper capital city. It's It's got that real kind of all the best bits of all the other European capitals, but it's not overrun by tourists and pickpockets like Barcelona. See, I love Barcelona. Yeah, everybody loves Barcelona. I'm not saying Barcelona is not lovable. Barcelona is very, very lovable. But people overlook Madrid because they go, oh, I'm going to go Barcelona instead. So I would say get yourself a mini break to Madrid. Seville is a different world and I've still never worked out a sort of British equivalent to living there. The whole system is completely feudal. Right. So it is one hundred percent old money. Okay. And all the families own all the properties and all the businesses. That's like it sounds like London to me. <laughs> that's, that, that's exactly like London. But there's no entrepreneurship. There was one uh homegrown business that was quite big, but that was it. Right. <laughs> Anyone else who had money, it was either family money or they were doctors or lawyers or whatever. So people who were... If you're on the right side of that line, you're very comfortably off. You know, your grandma's got a house by the beach, your uncle's got a house here, so you never have to rent with friends, ever. Right, so there's a class system. Oh, my God. When I think about the class system, I always think about the UK. No, 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 no. This is, this is just as bad, if not worse. Okay. I would say. And there's people with titles. I tell you who are completely revered are the bullfighters. Right. I thought it would be the footballers. The footballers are all actually quite boring, the Spanish ones, in terms of their love lives. It's the bullfighters who are the showbiz. That's very old school. Yeah, totally. You know, if you go to totally. a town where the bullfighters are like the celebrities, yeah. like, no, Cristiano Ronaldo, no, he is Juan, the bullfighter. Mm. Like, who cares about Juan? Yeah. Those guys But do. bullfighting is genuinely revolting. And the thing I didn't know about it is how much the bull is tortured before it's killed. Oh. I thought they just flicked the, you know, cape in its face and then skewered it. But no, they don't. They kind of stab it. So it, I won't oh. go into detail. Oh, I think it's, it's horrific. so horrific. But the other thing is, because um, Seville in the South is so what they call classista, so I'm this level, you're that level, the bullfighting season, it's a bit like the horse racing season here, is very much part of the social calendar. Right. So people will have almost like debenture seats. So my family sits in this bit and your family's only got a seat in that box there. And it's so, so one-upmanship. Even the churches, there are some churches that are better than others and it's all Wow, it sounds like fox hunting. Yeah. Like, exactly. a lot of people just... Exactly it was like about the fox. It was about the charade yeah and the totally the, 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 about, about the performance the performance of, of doing it and 100% up and this is your job you're, yeah. you're the guy in the red jacket and this is your job you're the person who has to run around absolutely the I was really shocked how big a fixture uh, bullfighting is in in southern Spain they've banned it in Catalonia because they're a bit more progressive there yeah but it will never ever ever get banned in the south never 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 well it's culture isn't it mm. Did you ever watch a bullfight? Never. Absolutely never. never. Were you open about the fact you didn't like it? Um, yeah. But people would just kind of shrug it off. I mean, it's also the other thing about that bit of Spain is that the older people very much drive the social life. Right. So if you go out to bars and restaurants and stuff, it's still mums and dads and so even grandmas. Influences. Yeah, totally. The other thing, so the, the, the heat was a problem as well. So from about March onwards, it'd be beautiful, so 25 degrees by May. And June, I think I once went out in 48 degree heat. Oh, that's ridiculous. That's, that's melting. Yeah. yeah. And actually, it's, I, I figured that 
I mean, I'm not great in the heat anyway, so I'm so pale and pasty, but I figured that, um, what's body temperature? Is it 37, 37 or 30, 38? Yeah. So anything above 37, 38 would actually make me mental because that the temperature outside it makes is hotter than you are. It makes to stay in. Yeah. And actually in the centre of the, of the town in Seville, um, even in Madrid actually, it's not that air conditioned because all the houses are quite old and cranky. Right. So you've got no air conditioning whatsoever. Um, and it was it was hard and it made me crazy. The thing I learned more than anything and, and what was truly life changing about living abroad, bearing in mind I hadn't even planned it until three months before I left, it was never an ambition really, is just how hard it is to be somewhere and not speak the language. I didn't speak a word of Spanish when, I, when I, was I got there. Ask you, so you didn't speak Spanish when not you were a there. word. And down south, it's not. I mean, Spain generally is not brilliant for English. Yeah, it's really not that great. Hence, why there's so much teaching work there, and the government are trying to chuck cash at the problem. But learning a language takes a long time. Yes, and I learn when you're learning, you can learn the first 20% quite quickly if yeah. you know how sort of past tense and future tense works. And then, of course, you just learn words for stuff and you can get by it's amazing what your coping mechanism is and you can sort of get by but like people do here like I don't know how to say this but I can say this and it's good enough for me to be understood yeah. but at times it would make me tearful that I try to I remember I don't know take trying to take something back to a shop once and she refused to let me take it back and I couldn't get the words out that I needed to explain to her why I wanted to take it and I cry sometimes because I was so frustrated it's stressful but you still did it so you speak fluent Spanish now I did I learned as I mean I've never worked so hard at anything in my life because it was driven by necessity right so all the other stuff that I was lazy at at school is just because I didn't care whereas this if I could have pressed a button or you know paid some money for someone to just give me Spanish I, I would have done so I would say I speak about 20% of French yeah and I've been at that level for the past yeah like, 15 years exactly and I've been trying hard right? well I did like, French but... at school and because my folks live in Kent we go up and down to France quite a lot um, and but the problem is we're learning Spanish especially in your 30s or any other language is it was one word of Spanish in two words of French out right to the okay. point where the next time I went to France I couldn't remember the word for thank you and someone gave me a copy <laughs> it was bad the other thing that was interesting is and this is going to sound dumb but I'll say it England and Spain are so different Right. Especially in, the, I mean, it's a two hour flight. It's a two decade difference yeah. in terms of, of everything. And I found myself getting really frustrated, almost a bit like Americans used to be when they came here. Going, oh my God, why can't you get this? And why? Right. You've, I found myself getting really impatient with just the slow the pace siesta. of life. Yeah, the, the siesta the, is the not, it, the siesta is not a myth. And a lot of the companies were trying to start modernising by only having a one-hour lunch break. Right. But the standard was still a three-hour lunch break. So you finish work at two. You yeah. go out for a full three-course meal. They do that kind of menu del dia thing where you get a starter main and pudding for like seven euros. Yeah. Uh, they go in for a kip and then they go back to work at five. Until it sounds like so, It's heaven. so... Yeah, but it's so unproductive. Also stuff like I'd be working in those gaps. So I'd work at eight o'clock in the morning and then at one o'clock in the afternoon and then at five o'clock. And between my kind of lunchtime and evening stints, I think, oh, I just need to pop and get some milk. I'd be halfway there and I'd go, what are you thinking? There's nothing open at four o'clock. I mean, literally there'd be no supermarkets open anywhere. See, what I like about it is it's anti-capitalist. It's not about money. It is a bit, actually. It's not about money. It's not about productivity. It's not about mm. profit. It's about we're tired. Mm. It's hot. We're going to have a nap. And Shut actually, out. eating out there is so cheap because they almost don't... They they set the prices to, to make enough to live. Yeah. They never, ever rip you off. And that's the one thing I really liked. Stuff like when we went to a little festival and we saw, uh, saw Public Enemy. <laughs> and at the festival, a beer at the festival costs exactly the same as it does in the town. Right. And that, so they that don't do that thing that we yeah. do here and go, oh, captive audience. Well, they, they don't do when that. When you're trapped. I remember going to a festival for the first time and I bought my own booze. Yeah. They wouldn't let me take no, it. No, of course in. not. And I was, I'd never, it hadn't occurred to me. And I'm like, I'm supposed to spend my whole day in this field mm. and have to buy anything. Mm. As it happened, on the day I was wearing a t-shirt a, a with a Guyanese flag on it. Mm. And the security person was Guyanese. Oh, get in. And that was God saying, you take your vodka into yeah, that yeah. field and get shit faced Athena. Brilliant. Um, and I did. Yeah, I've, luckily I've still got a couple of friends who live there, so I'll go and camp with them every now and again. And I'm so glad to know that bit really well. So there's lots of really sweet beaches. So a little, little plug for you people. Um, 
the Costa del Sol is on the east bit of Gibraltar. If you go to the coast that's west of Gibraltar, so it's Atlantic, right. it's a bit windier and colder, but it is completely free of British and German tourists and it's where all no the British yes, oh, it's where all the Spanish go for their holidays but it is that's what you want and it's amazing it's seafood they fish tuna off the coast and stuff and it's so so lovely oh, okay. so I'm, I'm so uh, I never use the word but I'm going to use the word blessed to have had that experience and to know that bit of the world really well it's quite a brave thing to do to say, well looking I'm, back I'm it was break, not a breakdown but I'm, I'm burnt out I've got no energy I've had enough I'm going to Spain. Well, the thing is, I think um, I'm not a massively proactive person, really. Uh, And so I always say now that it it took me getting to absolute rock bottom to have to act on something. So how many people are sitting in jobs going, God, I hate this job. But they kind of, you've got other stuff that gets in the way. You've got your day to day life. But I was at the point where I thought I can't physically get out of bed in the morning anymore and and go to work. And friends were saying to me, "You, you can't carry on. Yeah. Um, and, and so I thought, right, I'll, I'll quit. But I was scared about quitting because I didn't know where, and you know, cause I, I live by myself. I've got no one else to pay my bills. I was thinking, ah, um, and I eventually found a way to make that work. And as I said, Spain is as cheap as hell. I mean, 10 euro dinners. I miss, I miss that like mad. Yeah. And it was just, it was just the perfect thing to happen to me at that time in my life and now I'm in my 40s I can kind of look back at various stages in my life and go well that was awful but it eventually worked out that went wrong but then th- you ended up doing that and I think the older you get the more of those building blocks you have to look back on and go because of course when you're younger you don't know what's going to happen to you and you panic but now I've got the kind of uh, that life experience to be able to so when I came back to here I sort of thought it's almost like a clean slate, even though my friends and family were still here. So I just started, oh, I was looking for dancing lessons because I'd learned Spanish dancing a bit. I say learned. Like flamenco. Yeah, that's hard. Um, it's hard. <laughs> also, I'm very left handed. So and, and of course, all the arm flicks are with your right hand. And I saw that they were doing dance lessons at Sadler's Wells in uh, in. Clerkenwell and um, they also did comedy courses I said oh I'll, I'll do that instead Sadly as well do comedy courses they do yeah oh, that's a and the rest is history as it were so but, you gave up the dance for comedy yeah I didn't even go into the dance I just did a comedy and then and then it kind of went from there I never like used to watch videos of myself or anything right so I had no idea what people were seeing at all um, so mm. yeah I just and I met loads of nice people I think generally most of the girls were fairly sort of supportive of each other um, I met people my own age as well, which is quite important. Why do you think that's important? Because I think there's an overload on the comedy circuit, both open mic, semi-professional, professional. There's a glut of boys in their mid-20s. Yeah. And how often have you shared a journey home with a sort of 23-year-old comic <laughs> and you spend the whole journey just going over how their set went? This? Yeah, well, I put that bit in, but I don't normally do that bit. I'm like, mate, I don't give a shit. I really don't. And they'd go, oh, do you remember that bit I used to do about penguins? I'm like, no, I don't have your set memorised in the back of my brain. Thanks very much. But then there were other people I met who were loads younger than me who I just loved hanging out with. And, and you can have, I don't know, it's just kind of a different perspective on stuff and... You, you sort of get to cast aside your regular... Um, yeah, because by a certain age, you've got you've got quite a network and quite a sort of support oh, around yeah. you. Oh, yeah. I always say comedy made my world ten times bigger. Yeah. In many, but it doesn't stop your core ways. world. That, that, it doesn't change your core world. No, it just anything, expands it. People in your core world think you're really cool. Oh, I know. Like, oh, my gosh. You're yeah. Really, and they'll... Like, I'll think oh, you're so, so brave. Yeah. You know, but but I love the thing world. about... Oh, it's, it's so brave. I couldn't... I could, it's just so brave. First time someone came... You know, often how you meet people in the ladies' loo afterwards when you've been on, and they go, oh, yeah. well done. And so when I'd done my first 10 minutes, whenever that was, and she came on, she went, oh, you're so brave, you're so brave. I said, no, not really, I'm just a bit stupid to do this. She, she went, oh, no, I couldn't do it. I said, okay, tell me what you do. She went, oh, well, you know, I said, tell me what you do. She goes, um, I'm an events manager. And I said, I'm not kidding. That is literally the job I would be worst at. Yeah. Because I, I'm really disorganised. I loathe having any kind of responsibility. Like, so if something goes wrong, it's your fault. Like, I, that, that kind of thing just puts the fear of God no, into me. And there's no days off when you do something no, like that. It's no, like no. And it's day, constant phone line. calls of, oh, this person hasn't shown up or they've sent this to the wrong place. That is literally my worst life. And she looked at me and she went, oh, no, I've been doing it for years. I said, well, I couldn't do that. And she went, oh, OK, I never thought about it like that. So yeah. everybody's got stuff that they would be nervous about and everyone's got stuff that they're really not that great at. So just find something that you either don't get scared of or, or that you think you might be good at. Mm-hmm. 
I've now got my life back now that Love Island's finished. Okay, let's talk about Love Island. Yeah. Only because I don't watch it. Okay, I didn't watch it and I now do. And Let's I now don't think I ever won't watch it. Why did you start watching Love Island? You're right. a sophisticated, intelligent, bilingual person. Thank you. You know, you don't need this in your life. Why? Is I it don't. set in Spain? No. Oh. <laughs> so, do you remember the very first iteration of it? In Celebrity the mid-naughties, one. Celebrity Love I Island do. with that girl who shagged David Beckham and um, I think I do Shane, one of Boy's Own. And, and Callum Best. That's it. Okay. That's it. I'm old school. So I watched, I, I watched that. So in terms of my TV viewing habits, um, I have a couple of what I call chewing gum programs. One of them is a thing called Nothing to Declare. Okay. And it's because Australia, the ecosystem is so fragile. They have to be super, super strict about um, what people bring in. People (laughs) bring in um, all sorts of illicit foods. They will literally have suitcases full of food. And the way that the uh, officers speak to them is like, is this food? <laughs> oh, no, 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 not food. Do you put it in your mouth and eat it? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, well, then it's food. And it's it's just quite, it's very formulated. It's very repetitive and I love it. All right, so um, to declare, what's the other show? The, the other thing I love is a thing called Say Yes to the Dress, which is set in Kleinfeld Bridal Studio in Manhattan. And I'm not married, but I've got I've been through lots of wedding dress fittings with friends and what have you. And I just love anything to do with the psychology of something I'm really fascinated by. So you've got brides who have dreamed about their big day all their lives and were just missing the man to make it all come true. And then you've got other girls who just can't bear the idea of getting married and they leave their dress till three weeks before and what have you. Then you've got the mums involved, you've got the sisters, the jealous sisters, the bossy sisters. And it's just so fascinating to see how different people's idea of their perfect day, their perfect dress, their perfect whatever. Um, and I, I just quite like it. It's, it's very much to, to do with how women interact with each other. And it I am is. from a 100, well, not quite 100%, but I'm a, from a very female dominated family. So I have a sister. My mum's got two sisters. They've got girls. Um, my mum's father passed away when I was very little. So basically our Christmas table has been my dad. <laughs> about a thousand women so um so it's a, i come from a very female dominated family so i'm quite used to how those dynamics work and i find them quite interesting they are right? interesting oh, yeah. like we've got it now so i live in a place with baby mum and a grandma yeah and it's so just, you've got the three generations of oh girls my, but, but it's weird because i had to come back into my mum's place so i've not come back as a daughter i've come back as a mum mm. so you can imagine the friction Emily. oh we need to work at love island Love, okay, let's mm. let's let's finish on Love Island. Yeah. Why do you watch it? Why should I watch it? Okay, it so, looks awful. So traditionally, drama fiction has been about telling stories right. about fictional people, or sometimes you get a docudrama about a real life story based on real events. Love Island is effectively a real life drama, but just featuring the characters just happen to be real people. Right. So you get you get story arcs, you get villains, you get protagonists you get all sorts of but things but it's scripted reality right well i think it's it's orchestrated reality so okay. if something's happened you can you can kind of see the joins sometimes if if there's been a big argument or there's been a there's been a bit of a sort of you know um romantic liaison between somebody uh, the producers will say, okay, right, you and you, can you go over there and have a, have a chat about it? But the star of the show this year has been Ovi. So I know about Ovi. Everyone knows about Ovi. Yeah. And he is so universally a man for everybody. Right. Like for everyone. There was, if, if you disliked him, I'd really be interested to know you're racist. Why? Is it like, if you dislike him, you've got issues. Is it like that? Well, so I think nice. if, you, if you dislike him, you, you have issues with, with human beings in general. Yeah. And the best thing about Love Island, and I can't believe you've never got on the back of this, is, and I only really found this out last year, I'm pretty Twitter literate, I would say. Thank you. I said, I'm said i quite tw- Twitter literate, but what I didn't understand was, I knew about black Twitter, Scottish Twitter, all the rest of it, but there's a thing called Fiat 500 Twitter. Yeah, I know about that. And what yeah. does that mean to you? Because to me, like I didn't really it's, understand it's it. It's kind of women yeah. who drive Fiat 500. It's women who drive Fiat 500. <laughs> On Twitter. And the thing that landed it for me, it's girls that put little kisses in their Twitter handle. Yeah, X-O-X-O-X. Or maybe they'll have a little, bu- a little yeah. butterfly in there. To- and once I read that, I was like, I know exactly who that is. So Love Island is effectively 
a war of attrition between Black Twitter and Fiat 500 Twitter. Yeah. And it, if you can follow the right people or you can get on the, the hashtags and stuff, it has made me weep with laughter. <laughs> so I now watch Love Island for the comedy value as well. Right. That's in, I wouldn't everything I know about Love Island comes from Black Twitter it's interesting that Ovi this year is mm. like the standout guy mm. everyone loves him because mm. I've just always found it quite anti-black mm. and the reason being is that every year well anti-black a, women definitely oh, yeah particularly but then a lot, some of the men are anti-black women too which is made yeah. up for debate but that's kind of what I perceive and there's always some conversation about oh I like I like my men mixed race this was it and, last year yeah. so so last year, they, were, they and I, because I hadn't watched the previous seasons, last year there was a girl called Samira who was absolutely lovely. She was a dancer. She was very intelligent, gorgeous, and just not too, not too kind of tiger, tiger, if uh, if I may use that expression. So, and, and she was the first ever black woman that they put in from the start. I didn't know this because I hadn't watched previous seasons. And just nobody was going for her at all. Absolutely right. nobody was picking her. Whereas all the white girls on the show were saying exactly, oh, I like mixed race men. I love mixed race men. I think, can you actually say that? Um, yeah, can you and- specify that you like this exact type of person? And which kind of mixed race? Yeah. Because there's lots of mixed race. And so I immediately said Love Island ain't for me because if you are a producer or a director and you're hearing that sentence and you're broadcasting yep. I define that as racism mm. to say I like people black but not too black mm. I can't think of anything more offensive mm. so the fact this was being endorsed but also it's it's the men that always do better yes. so this year they had quite a lot of mixed race men in it and all of them were absolutely sort of storming through it and in the end I think two of them if not three ended up being the villains of the piece for no other reason other than they were just dickheads to their right respective lady pals um but yeah there's there's definitely a a, a racial element to it divided into to male and female you you don't get any uh, Indians on there I don't think Indians Chinese people no nope, there's been no Chinese people um there's just a lot a lot of races on on the planet so I, th- I think it's really easy to have lots of people of different races in, a, in an island where they're supposed to have sex with each other mm. and not be racist. I can't think of anything more easier. Mm. So the fact that that seems to happen, yeah. and that was the thing that happened last year that made me think it's not for me. Mm. But that didn't ha- there wasn't any of that this year. Um, well, there was a scientist. So they had this uh, girl called Yuande, who was an yes. Irish Nigerian scientist. <laughs> quite a small demographic in itself yeah. and again I mean she she was quite guarded and she didn't want to sort of give away too much and and again she just didn't really seem to be getting picked and then this guy picked her because people understand the mechanisms of the show and that they know that if the public has seen someone not really get getting any action for a t- couple of weeks they'll know that they can be popular by going in on their white horse and kind of sweeping them off their feet yeah. so this guy totally screwed her over but she came away the the hero of the piece and and what have you so she she really stood up for herself and okay what are you up to what at the mo- <laughs> at the moment so next next weekend or the weekend after i've got my dad's 80th birthday party happy birthday thanks very much and i'm gonna have to make a cake for him so this month is gonna just be a bit of quiet time at home and in london because i'm self-employed it's either feast or famine as most self-employed people will know so the last couple of months have been super busy which is great but it means I've hardly had time to do any just kind of normal boring stuff. So I'm just going to chill out in London for August. I don't usually go away in the deep summer, do you? Um, no, my August are normally in Edinburgh. Yeah. So it's weird. Well, this is the second year in a row I'm not going to Edinburgh. Just, I don't know, I, I sort of, I guess I know fewer and fewer people up there. You weren't going to be there. My normal kind of crew were not going to be there. So I just figured it's a lot of money to spend um, to be cold. <laughs> and I'll just, I'll just see, I'll just see all the shows I want to see um, in Soho Theatre, which is a great place to see uh, Edinburgh shows. And then, what else am I doing? Oh God, I sound so boring. No, you don't sound boring. You sound like you're living <laughs> your best life. To be honest, like I've just, I've just come back from three days away with five little boys, which um, is. <laughs> and little baby girl chirps up just right on cue. Yeah, like oh, and that was really five? fun. But they're really active, so we did. I did more sport in a day than I would normally do in a week. Oh, listen, 
Ch children, it's like living with a gym. Yeah. You're just always picking up after them, bending over, yeah. squatting. Okay, Katie, people might want to follow you after this, stalk you. Stalk me. Um, how can they How can They, they can that? follow me on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is K-T with an I-E. So K-T-I-E, K-Lane. Right, and if you're, okay, if you're not, you're not black Twitter, you're not 500 uh, Twitter, I'm not. what are you? Oh, I don't know. Okay. I, I am a, I am in the gallery of black Twitter. <laughs> I know I don't contribute, but I Spectator. spectate. That's the point. That's what, because I like to think myself as part of black Twitter. And we no, but you are. You definitely yes, are. Yeah, and I, like I get my feed. So I follow, apart from you, I couldn't even name half of them. So there's a girl called Danielle who I follow. There's five or six people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's five or six people I follow that get me my perfect black Twitter feed. As in, not so much that I'm completely out of my depth, but just enough to know what the kind of in jokes are, and I now know who Slumflower is, which yeah, is yeah, she's not divisive. Re not really something I ever wanted to know, but there we she's go. She's divisive, yeah. Um, so in terms of, well, I, I'm just on Twitter. I'm the same as I always am. I'm half in, half out. So I follow sort of political, satirical people, and then I also follow Rylan. So, um, he's great. Oh, I love Rylan. He's grown on me. Absolutely love him. Here's another one. If people say they didn't... Rylan is like a white Ovi. <laughs> you know, it's true. And I always thought, why are you going on the X Factor if you can't sing? It's like, uh, why not? Yeah. Right? That's no, he's wonderful. And he's not even 30. Yeah. So he's think a, of the life he's, he's got ahead a, of him. He's a good guy. All yeah, right, he really Katie, is. Follow Katie on Twitter. Um, I don't know what else to say. Thanks yeah. for coming around. Thanks for having me. And thank you for eating all of the food. <laughs> Thanks for making me all the I'm food. I'm a mum now. This makes me happy. I know. Uh, thank you. You've been fantastic. It's Bye. been a pleasure. So that was Katie Lane. Thank you so much for coming, Katie. I love that conversation. It's nice to cover topics as wide ranging as living abroad, having breakdowns and Love Island. And for the record, Katie is one of the only people on the planet that has successfully been able to get me to even consider watching Love Island, which is quite a big deal because it's something I never thought I'd ever bother watching. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate, subscribe, share, comment, do whatever it is you normally do with podcasts that you like. Thank you so much for listening and we'll catch up next time.